World War I, Life and the Home Front. Combatants in World War I quickly began to use total war tactics, meaning that land was completely destroyed, resources were destroyed, and even the production of war materials took over all production in, in the country. Governments committed all their nation's resources and took over industry in order to win the war. So as much as this was a battle between people on the battlefield, this was also a battle between countries and how fast are they able to produce wartime material to keep the war going, to be able to continue to fight the war. What you're seeing here is a room full of bombs. And what these ladies and young men are doing is they're testing the primer heads on each of the bombs. They're setting the primer heads. So as soon as these bombs are ready to go, they'll be loaded onto airplanes, ships, and they'll be ready to use in battle. Soldiers were drafted. The media was censored. Propaganda was created to support the war. Now, we talked about propaganda yesterday. Here's a great poster that was posted in England during the time of the war. The British Empire Union, once a German, always a German, really depicts the Germans as evil. Here we have a, a picture of the propaganda that was used to show the violence of Germans march through Belgium. And remember yesterday I told you that one of the propaganda pieces showed a German soldier with a Belgium baby at the end of a pike. Here's the propaganda to show the evil and brutality of the Germans, how they were victimizing people as they crossed through to France, 1914 to 1918, never again. Remember, every German employed means a British worker idle. Every German article sold means a British article unsold. So this propaganda is very anti-German and it's promoting British and it's, it's a divisive tactic in order to um, depict one group's preference over another. New industrial weapons were introduced on the battlefield such as machine guns, airplanes, blimps, both sides used this new technology. The machine gun increased to 600 rounds per minute. One of the most famous World War I planes, the British Sopwith Camel, had a front-mounted machine gun for dogfights. Planes were also loaded with bombs, as were the floating gas-filled airships called Zeppelins. There were heavy artillery tanks, poisonous gas, flamethrowers, and this was the first war that used submarines. This is an anti-aircraft gun. Poisonous gas. The yellow-green chlorine fog sickened, suffocated, burned, and blinded its victims. And gas masks became standard use. It was during World War I that the production of nylon, like as in women's um, pantyhose, became an important part of a US soldier's military pack because you use the nylon in the gas mask as part of the filter to filter out these noxious gases that were being used by the Germans. Tanks like this French light tank, little tank, were used to mow down barbed wire and soldiers. And we're gonna talk about trenches in just a second and you'll understand why this little French tank like this was needed to barge through the barbed wire. You can see here loading these heavy pieces of artillery and some of the biggest guns that had ever been produced in order to shoot down airplanes or enemy aircraft. These weapons led to unprecedented deaths and casualties. Here we have the last wars of Europe, the Thirty Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars, the Russo-Japanese War. Look at the millions in World War I, over eight million killed, and no telling how many others wounded. These gentlemen here are missing limbs from the brutalities of the war. <laughs> 
To protect soldiers from enemy fire, both the Allies and Central Powers built these huge trenches. Okay, so let's take a look at what the breakdown of the trench is. On the very back side of the trenches, you had heavy rounds of heavy artillery that were uh, aimed at the enemy. So the artillery fire softened up the resistance before an infantry attack. So you would begin with your heavy artillery shooting over the lines into your enemy's territory. Then you have the communication trenches. These connected three kinds of trenches together. So you had like uh, little connectors in between the trenches in order to get the communications <clears throat> out to the fighting men who were down here in these muddy, wet, cold trenches. And you see right here, not too terribly deep. You spent most of your time hunched over in the cold. Saps more shallower trenches in no man's land. Here you are. This is the edge of the end of safety. No man's land. You did not stick your head up out of the trenches here because the enemy fire would come in and you may not have one at the end of the engagement. You put barbed wire and entanglements up here on this part of the trench to make sure that no one could jump up and run across. It was a boundary here. This allowed access to machine gun nests, grenade throwing positions, and observation posts here in the saps. Trench warfare made it difficult for either side to gain an advantage. You could get in the trench and you could stay there for months at a time and never gain a foot of distance. Fighting on the Western Front slowed to a stalemate and neither side could gain an advantage. They were bogged down in the trench. Two million soldiers were killed or wounded during the battles of Verdun and of the Somme. And this was one of those battles where they were in the trenches, charging the trenches. And if you came up out of the ground, you were an open target. German U-boats patrol the Atlantic Ocean, attacking Allied cargo ships, attempting to dock in any European harbor that could possibly have war materials on board. The Germans sank the ships. We talked about this yesterday with the sinking of the Lusitania. On the Eastern Front, that's over here now. On the Eastern Front, the Russian army was struggling to hold against the German army. The German army was large. It was well advanced. It had used its industry in order to produce a large amount of war making materials. And Russia was not that prepared. Russia was struggling to produce enough weapons or food to support the war effort. And here you see Russian women being trained for combat because Russia did not have enough soldiers in order to fight and defend their borders in this war. Millions of Russian soldiers and civilians died in the war. And one of the reasons was because so much had been converted into wartime production that there were no civilian goods available. Most of the crops had been taken to, fill, uh, to feed their military and their civilians were suffering at home from lack of the basic necessities of life. By 1917, Russia was on the brink of collapse. In November 1917, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrew the Russian government and established the Soviet Union, which became the world's first communist nation. So it was during World War I that communism was born in Russia. Here you see Vladimir Lenin in one of his speeches. He grew up as an extremely poor, poverty-ridden child with a very poor family, rose through the ranks, of the um, Bolsheviks and had become a rather important orator talking to people about how bad off Russia was and, and how he, would, he had a plan. His plan was communism, which was an idea written in the book, The Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Karl Marx's idea was that under communism, everyone was to live in this perfect utopia where everybody was equal and no one could have more than another. 
The USA remained neutral in World War I from 1914 to 1917. Remember, we're practicing isolationism. We do not at this time want to get involved in a war in Europe. But due to German violations of free trade, the United States declared war in April 1917. After the sinking of the Lusitania and after the Zimmerman note, we got involved in World War I. After America's declaration of war in 1917, the U.S. had to mobilize before it could fight in Europe. And mobilize means we've got to get enough soldiers in the military, pre-train them. We've got to turn our production around from civilian goods to military goods to build up the military. You've probably seen this poster before. This is American propaganda. Uncle Sam, I want you for the U.S. Army. Another side note, this was also the beginning of um, Fort Benning here in Columbus. This was the first time that they were training soldiers at Fort Benning. After America's declaration of war in 1917, the U.S. had to mobilize before it could fight, which means it needed, it only had 200,000 soldiers currently in their military ranks. So obviously a draft was needed. The military needed massive supplies of armaments. Here you see a woman working on a machine or a, a gun barrel, drilling out a barrel. President Wilson and Congress created 5,000 bureaucratic agencies to help manage and win the war. And it wasn't managing the people. It wasn't managing the military. It was managing industry. The USA supported the Allied powers, but the Americans entered the war for their own reasons. President Wilson wanted to keep the U.S. military separate from the other allied forces. This is the first time that we had sent Americans overseas with the idea that they would be a unified and under another nation's military control. That concerned President Wilson. He didn't like the ideas of American soldiers taking orders from British military leaders or from French military leaders. So he wanted to keep the American military under its own leadership. And the American Expeditionary Force was led by John Pershing as an independent American military. They would only take orders from American officers only. Congress passed the Selective Service Act to draft men between the ages of 18 and 45 into the Army, and 2.8 million Americans were drafted into the military. Here you see some of the propaganda, the sentiment of every mother in America. Here's my boy, meaning I am letting go of my boy to go overseas to fight in the war. Registration cards from the time period. fathers kissing their children goodbye to go to Europe to fight. 400,000 black soldiers were drafted but served in segregated units. Colored man is no slacker, a very similar poster to the one that you saw before saying goodbye to wives and loved ones and heading overseas. True Sons of Freedom, this was another propaganda poster. Notice the picture of Abraham Lincoln here. Uh, the idea here is you fought for your freedom before, come fight for the freedom of others. Pushing back, this is black soldiers pushing back the German line. The War Industries Board was created to oversee the production of the military supplies. And it encouraged the mass production of war equipment and set production quotas. For example, the War Industries Board approached Ford Motor Company. They needed Ford Motor Company's ability to mass produce. Remember that this was Henry Ford's dream of the assembly line, quick production of the car. Well, they wanted to take this assembly line process and put it to use in the war to quickly assemble. So the War Industries Board went to Ford Motor Company and asked them to build airplanes. So Ford Motor Company supplied engines. They built airplanes on site in order for the military to have the number of airplanes that they needed in order to fight the war. In 
The Food Administration was created to ration foods and encourage Americans to grow victory gardens. Food will win the war. The one thing that was a great concern was that American soldiers may not be able to get the food and nutrition that they needed to stay healthy and be able to continue the fight. It would take a while to get food products across the Atlantic Ocean under the constant threat of being sunk by U-boats. So the idea was at home, here's what we can do. We'll switch our production from consumer food production that you could buy in grocery stores and we'll encourage people to grow their food at home. So food will win the war. We observe meatless days, wheatless days, porkless days, and carry out the conservation rules of the U.S. Food Administration. They are giving all. Will you send them wheat? So all of this is about preserving the food supply in order to send it over to Europe to keep the fighting men going. Defeat the Kaiser and his U-boats. Victory depends on which fails first, food or frightfulness. Waste nothing. Uh, canning food for long periods of time. This is when a lot of um, families started growing those victory gardens in their yards. In cities, they built community gardens where uh, maybe uh, an apartment building would have their own garden and everyone contributed to the upkeep of it, seeds, plucking weeds, harvesting, and then women would can the foods. I still remember my grandmother canning foods, and she was a child of the Great Depression, which we'll talk about later, but she had learned how to can food and vegetables and be able to keep things for long periods of time because under these restrictions, you didn't know when the next time was you may be able to go to the grocery store. Here's an example of the Victory Gardens. City and farms would produce gardens for their own self-sufficiency. And of course, you could sell these products to the local grocers, but you were encouraged to grow this for your own consumption. Cut your food costs. The Fuel Administration was created to ration coal and oil and to encourage the lightless nights. Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam needs that extra shovel full of coal in order to win the war. Save gasoline. It's a war necessity. Don't spill. Don't permit leaks. Use it wisely. Stop the leaks and save the drops. So make sure that you are conserving fuel. The Committee on Public Information was created to make propaganda to support the war effort. So this was the organization that made all these posters that you've been looking at, who uh, made short movies and speeches and unfortunately also censored the press. You were not allowed to print any negative information about the ongoing war effort in the United States. The second official United States war picture, America's Answer. The Division of Films and Committee on Public Information and taken by the U.S. Signal Corps. Here's your famous poster that you've probably seen before and defend your country and list now in the U.S. Army. The Committee on Public Information also encouraged bond drives in order to raise war for the money. If you would purchase government bonds, what that means is when you purchase a bond, you're getting a certificate and you're giving the government your money. The certificate is the, allowing the government to keep the money for an amount of time. And then once your bond expires, you can take your certificate back in and you'll get your money back plus a little bit of interest from letting the U.S. government borrow your money. That would help supply the ongoing war effort. With the U.S., with the military and economic economy mobilized for war, the first U.S. troops were sent to Europe in 1918. To combat German U-boats, the USA used a convoy, that should say convoy, system to deliver soldiers and supplies to Europe. They would go in um, groups of ships, so it was like a protected set of ships. Five or six would go at a time to try to combat being sunk by U-boats across the Atlantic in order to get to the docking stations here that you see in Great Britain and in France. <laughs> 
Here is the convoy system here. You had a destroyer. You had a defensive boundary ship. You had cruisers. Here was the safe zone with the merchant ship. The idea was the enemy submarine may not necessarily know which one of the ships may have the cargo on it. But each of these defensive ships had uh, anti-submarine missiles and had lookouts looking for those enemy submarines. Now, we lost many ships anyway in the convoy system, but it was the best way in order to escort these ships across the Atlantic. The arrival of fresh American soldiers and war supplies helped the Allies at a very crucial time. U.S. soldiers saw their first action in May 1918 outside Paris and helped resist a German offensive and participated in the counterattack into Germany. Throughout 1918, the American Expeditionary Force fought with the Allied forces to turn the tide of the war, and the war was brutal. This was the first time that we started seeing shell-shocked soldiers, sounds, sights, smells, the horrors of war. If your friend died in the trenches next to you, there's no guarantee they could even get the body out. So it was a very hard time for these soldiers seeing these cruelties of war. By October 1918, Bulgaria, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire had surrendered. And on November the 9th, 1918, German Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated his throne. On November 11th, 1918, Germany signed an armistice with the Allies and World War, II, World War I came to an end. This is Armistice Day. The USA reluctantly entered World War I and played only a supportive role in the fighting, but the war did change America. The USA only fought for eight months, not the whole four years, we had 7% casualties, not the 52% like most of the allied powers. Here's a chart of the military casualties during World War I. Austria-Hungary leads with almost 85, 90% of their soldiers. This wiped out entire families and generations in Europe. The commitment to total war stimulated American industry and transformed lives on the home front, especially for women. World War I had a huge impact on the United States and we're gonna take a look now at how Americans at home dealt with these uh, issues. The domestic consequences of World War I. It accelerated America's emergence as the world's greatest industrial power, contributed to the movement of African-Americans to Northern cities, intensified anti-immigrant and anti-radical sentiments among the mainstream Americans, and brought over 1 million women into the workforce. Here we have women in the workforce for the first time taking over those roles that men once held, leaving the home, providing those services, keeping their homes going by continuing to receive paychecks, while at the same time helping advance the war effort. These ladies here are working on the ribs of a wing on an airplane at Ford Motor Company in Michigan. Back our girls over there. Telephone operators became a very important job. This is a lady here at the switchboard switching communication lines back and forth. The greatest mother in the world. This is a propaganda ad asking for women to join the Red Cross to be nurses. Notice she's holding here. Um, uh, this is a wounded soldier in her arms cradling, caring for those who have been injured at war. There were some issues here. Kaiser Wilson, referring to Woodrow Wilson. Kaiser is the German term 
you could call it king in Germany. Have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. This is to push women's suffrage. This is to push the passing of the 19th Amendment. So our women's roles changed during the war. Women did men's work on railroads, coal mines, shipbuilding, and munitions to meet the war-related demand and to replace soldiers who were needed. Women worked with the Food Administration by planting those victory gardens, volunteered in the Red Cross, and sold war bonds. For the first time, women served in the Army in non-combatant roles as telephone operators, nurses, typists, and drivers. The government acknowledged the role that women played in the war by passing the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Here we have the propaganda poster with Abraham Lincoln overlooking the fight. Uh, it's kind of a doctored uh, uh, edition of what the Civil War would have looked like, pushing back the German soldiers with African-American soldiers. You see the airplanes here. It's a new era. Colored men, the first Americans who planted our flag on the firing line, true sons of freedom. The African-American population was continuing to grow and now beginning to move out of the South in search of jobs in the industrial cities of the North. We call this the Great Migration. Three hundred and sixty seven thousand and more blacks were drafted, but only 10 percent served in combat duty and most worked as laborers in the army services of supplies unit. So you ran the supplies out to the line to the soldiers on the front line fighting. Those who did see combat were in segregated divisions. Over six hundred black soldiers were commissioned as officers in the U.S. Army during World War I. World War I also led to the great migration of blacks for war-related jobs in the northern cities, jobs in Detroit, in order uh, manufacturing jobs, building airplanes, building the machines needed to fight the war. Pay was better, and the idea was that life would be better after leaving the Jim Crow South. Northern manufacturers distributed free railroad passes to bring Southern Blacks into Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. However, it wasn't always met with welcome. Blacks faced violence, discrimination, and race riots, especially in Chicago during this great migration. America also experienced a red scare as the result of the war. Remember, we talked about Vladimir Lenin as the father of communism's growth in Russia. Well, the fear was this new socialist party may also come to the United States. And in a way, it did. And we're going to talk about Eugene Debs. 1917, Vladimir Lenin and his Bolsheviks created the Soviet Union. It was based on communism, which is a single party dictatorship. The government controls all of the factories, railroads, and businesses, meaning it controls 100% of the factors of production in that country. Civilians could own nothing. Now, this created a great fear for America. Would this idea of socialism and communism make its way into the American borders? So people had a red scare, a fear of the spread of communism, a fear of the spread of socialism. In America, Eugene Debs, he formed the first socialist party calling for an end to the war. He wanted government control of factories and increase of the unions. And every time there was a strike, people started to worry, is this the beginning of communism coming to the United States? Personal liberties were restricted during World War I. Don't talk. The web is spun for you with invisible threads. 
keep out of it, help to destroy it. So it was pretty much if you were speaking uh, pro-German or you were speaking uh, pro-socialism or you were for communism, the idea was, no, don't talk about it. Report people who were talking about it. Report people who had communist ideas or were following the ideas of Eugene Debs. This brings us to Schenck versus the United States. During World War I, Schenck mailed circulars to draftees, and these circulars suggested that the draft was wrong and that it was motivated by capitalism. Schenck was charged with conspiracy to violate the Espionage Act, but did allow people to practice the First Amendment. So let's take a look a little bit more about this. When Congress passed the Espionage and Sedition Act, it made it illegal to interfere with the war or say anything disloyal about the war effort. So you had to be careful who you talked to. You had to be careful what you said. People were listening. During the war, 2,000 citizens were prosecuted, including newspaper editors, socialists, anarchists, union leaders, and anybody who criticized the draft of these soldiers into the military. Charles Schenck, as you just read, was a socialist and anti-war critic, and he had been arrested arguing that the laws violated free speech. His case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1919. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that in wartime, any speech that presents a clear and present danger is not protected under the First Amendment. And this case has been used several times, even in the modern era, with people during wartime who have made comments against the government or have um, supported terrorist organizations. This case usually comes up because it's the example of how the First Amendment isn't always protected if there's a clear and present danger to the safety of the public or the um, rights of the U.S. government to operate as a legal entity. Anti-German sentiment was very high across the nation. Nobody wanted to be associated with anybody with a German last name who had German relatives. Uh, in fact, it was so bad that after World War I, the uh, British family had to change its name. At the time of the war, King George V was on the throne in England and his family's name, um, his mother was uh, Queen Victoria. And when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert Saxe Coburg and Gotha of Germany, they had the German name of Saxe Coburg Gotha. So obviously during World War I, King George V was pushed to take a look at the family name because there was so much anti-German sentiment. So on July the 17th, 1917, King George V issued a proclamation and declared the name of Windsor. They changed their name from saxe coburg Gotha to Windsor, a much more English sounding name to be his royal house and family. And he relinquished any use of the German titles and dignities. So the reason that the name of the royal family today is Windsor is because of the anti-German sentiment during World War I. World War I stimulated the American economy. Wartime production increased the hourly wages by 20% in some industries. The average household income nearly doubled. Americans had money to spend and a desire for consumer goods, and this led to a decade of spending in the 1920s that we call the Roaring Twenties. So this is the business cycle beginning at the beginning of the war in 1914, and look at 1920. Americans were richer, they were working better jobs, they had money to spend, and they wanted to buy stuff. When World War I ended, the USA was the wealthiest nation in the world. Before the war, the USA had 
was owed, or excuse me, the USA owed $3 billion to foreign nations. And this money was because we were buying foreign goods, bringing it into the United States, and we were paying back the bills. But by the end of the war, the foreign nations who we helped with our American production and our American goods and our American soldiers now owed the United States a bill of $13 billion. When World War I ended, Americans were ready to return to normalcy, and they elected Republican President Warren Harding to do that. 